Ben Simmons, though. But that's the same guy. Yeah, but Ben ain't Ben can't shoot. Ben can't shoot. Ben can't shoot. Right. Facts. All right, let's bring it in. What's up, world? It's your boy, Big Squeeze, WOVU 95.9 FM. Um, I'm here with uh, with the homie, close personal friend of mine. <laughs> he like, yo, I don't know you, dude. I, I got Dr. Umar Johnson in the building with me right now. How you doing, sir? Peace and love, family. Glad to be back. Cleveland, stand up. Ohio, I'm here. It's going down tonight. African American Museum of Cleveland. Doors open up at 5, program at 7. All children, 17 and under, and all elders, 65 and older, they get in there for free. Oh, that's dope. That's so, dope. Doc, uh, what is the, the, the event about? Uh, my focus is going to be on education and economics. Uh, I stand on the premise that those are the two biggest areas, most important areas that we need to address as a people in order for us to bring about true political economic liberation. There's a lot of other aspects of the struggle there's a lot of other aspects of our backwardness as a people but if we want to start making some forward progress we have to address economics and we have to address education we have to address education because you have to prepare the next generation of african children in the responsibility of nation building and you have to deal with economics because economics is the lifeblood of a people if folks don't have food clothing and shelter which can only come by way of economics then how do you organize a people who are barely surviving you see another thing we need to recognize one of the reasons why we don't have the type of loyalty that we want from our own community our own brothers and sisters is because economically we cannot provide them with opportunities see for the Chinese child is easy to be loyal to the Chinese community for the Jewish child is easy to be loyal to the Jewish community for the East Indian child is easy to be loyal to the East Indian community why is that if I need a job they're gonna get me one mm -hmm. if I'm homeless they're gonna find me a place to live if I'm naked they're gonna find me clothing how often do you see a homeless European Jew? How often do you see a homeless Chinese? How often do you see a homeless East Indian? You don't because they look out for the whole. Whereas African people, we are selfish and we're only concerned about ourselves and maybe our children and it goes that far. Most of us do not have a collectivist identity or a collectivist consciousness. Well, so uh, good segue into that question goes into my next question. Um, so how can we as a people progress? So mm -hmm. I know I know you. Oh, I don't mm -hmm. know you, but I know you. I got you. I followed you. Mm -hmm. And so you've been we've, you've been preaching this stuff for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, how can we actually move forward and you know actually have steps and, uh, and a solution to actually do these? Well, things? remember, all work that must be done for African people mm -hmm. must be done through teamwork. Mm -hmm. Okay, it takes the group to move the body forward. There is no lone man at the top. There is no lone woman at the top. The reason we have a hard time understanding that it's going to take collaboration in order for us to get this done is because most of us have been brainwashed with the white Jesus concept, which basically says that one person can solve the problems for all of us. So we've been raised in the church, and in the church, Jesus comes, and Jesus solves everyone's problem. And because of that, most of us are looking for that black knight in shining armor to swoop in and save the entire <coughs> community. And one of the reasons we love believing in the Jesus concept of a lone savior is because it absolves me of responsibility. See, as long as I think someone is coming to save black folks... I don't have to be disciplined with my spending habits. I don't have to be more responsible with my children. I don't have to sacrifice my blood, sweat, and tears to help out other black people because a lone savior is coming. And this is why black people love to prop up one leader because he now becomes the scapegoat, the excuse, and the justification for why everyone else has not changed their political and economic behavior. Uh, mm. Like the uh, Barack Obama said. Without question. Okay. In fact, the reason white America was able to use Barack Hussein Obama against black America was because of that very mental imbalance that we have of looking for that lone savior. If we rejected this notion that one black man is going to save 40 million black folks, Obama 
could have never been as successful as he was mm. dismissing black people and stripping from us everything that our ancestors fought for for the past 150 years and giving it to the LBGT community, the multicultural community, the feminist community, and even the immigrant community. See, there's something that a lot of Obama supporters don't want to admit, but it's factual, and that is this. Up until Barack Obama, 43 presidents prior, black people were the priority minority in this country since 1619. Mm. Every president, you were their priority minority. It doesn't mean they did anything for you. It doesn't mean that they were a supporter, but they had to address you one way or the other because you were the priority minority. Every president, every governor, every mayor had to decide where they stand on the black American issue. After Barack Obama, you're no longer the priority minority. Yeah. So from Donald Trump forward, black people never have to be considered at the political table because we allow one black man, we allow one black man to take everything we fought for, give it to another population, and take our entire black agenda off the table. So Donald Trump don't have to address black folks. The next president don't have to address black folks. And it's our fault because we allow racism to use a black man to erase black people's issues off the political table. So you feel that politically black people are worse off after Obama than, Look at before, the statistics. than, than before Obama? Look at the statistics. Education, higher dropout. Incarceration, definitely up. Home ownership, down. Black share of the wealth of America, down. Our statistics under Barack Obama are worse than they were under George W. Bush and his father. And the reason for that is because we said, since the president is black, he don't have to do anything else but be black. Mm. That was one of the worst public proclamations we could have ever made. Even if you feel that way, you don't let white folks hear you say that. Even if you're comfortable with the president being black, you don't let the world know that this man don't have to do a damn thing for me except be black. But because you said that, they rolled back the Civil Rights Bill. Because you said that, they rolled back the Voting Rights Act. Because you said that, the set-asides for black folks, the percentages of the contracts, our membership in the unions of America, they rolled back everything on black folks during the Obama years, and they did it because they know he would do nothing about it, and they knew we would say nothing about it. If you want to control black folks, put a black person in office. And that's why statistically, when you look at our condition as a people, since the rise of the black politician, which began in the 1970s, each and every time we get a black politician, the condition of the community gets worse. You've had a few exceptions, a Maynard Jackson in Atlanta, a Adam Clayton Powell in New York. There are few exceptions, but they are few. And the reason we do worse when we get a black face in office is because that black face, 95% of the time, was financed and controlled by white power and white money. 95% of every black politician in office is a Democrat. They are beholden and obligated to the Democratic Party. That's where they get their money. That's where they get their campaign funding. That's where they get their campaign strategy from. White folks are using black Democrats like a ventriloquist. They're nothing but dummies on a string that get told what to do and how to get there. If we want to be effective politically, we divest from the political parties. We divest from the Republican. We divest from the Democrat. We divest from the Green Party, the Libertarians, and we all register as independents. Mm. We don't need to be a part of a white party, and we don't even need a black political power, black political party. What we need is a black political union. Organize blocks of black voters who are willing to cast their vote in the direction that benefits the black community. Okay, so I, I guess to re reframe my question. Sure. I'm just asking in regards to like, the presidency, right? Yes, sir. In regards to the, the office itself. Yes, sir. Your argument sounds as if you're saying that now the presidency has less to, um, black people have less to bargain at the table with, oh, absolutely. with, with, with it. Absolutely. But, and, and I guess my question is, that argument to me sounds misleading in the way that George Bush, Clinton, you even look at Lyndon B. Johnson, Okay. Even if optically, black people are at the table, they're creating policies to the poor black people. We're all at 
but you know, by every statistic, even if you're looking at um, after the civil rights bill is being passed, mm -hmm. um, what is really being done in order to support black people, especially when you bring in Reagan, especially mm -hmm. when you bring in Nixon. Mm -hmm. So I guess for me, it seems like it's easy for us to, um, to highlight Barack Obama, right? Um, mm -hmm. I think it's easy to make it controversial, but when you look at the presidency itself, regardless of if black people are seen to be at the table mm -hmm. or if bills are being passed to support our people, um, every president has immensely failed um, Barack Obama just due to the, the, the level of systematic... Let's stay with your premise, mm -hmm. which I agree with. Which I agree with. So taking your premise, my question then becomes, if every president has been a dismal failure with regard to black people, which I totally agree with, the only difference with Obama is you don't even get brought up in the conversation post Obama. Pre Obama, you got brought up in the conversation. You don't even count no more. But staying with that premise, if you are correct, and I believe you are 100%, why did we single him out as a success story when his presidency brought nothing tangible, immeasurable to the black reality? Sticking with your premise, because it is correct. Why was he celebrated? When his presidency was no more beneficial, measurably, practically, and materialistically than the 43 that preceded him. Because isn't it embedded in the black identity that we are all aware that we are given very little and we make the most out of what we're given? I th and, and, and I, I think okay. that... I think so you're making the assumption that Obama was a gift to black folks? No, I'm making the assumption that Barack Obama was black and he was given what we all get, which is a little bit of nothing, and you make... A little bit of something out of a little bit of nothing. And what did we make? What was the little bit of something we made out of that little oh, bit of nothing? I, I, I think even if you're, even if you bring up, let's say, police brutality, right? Mm -hmm. So did we get any large overarching policy? No, 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 no. We ain't asking for large and overarching. Did you get any policy against police brutality under Barack Obama? I think I, I think we got Name a level. One. I, Name one act. Hold on. Wait. Okay. I think we got a level of leadership. I think I think that mm -hmm. one. One, if we're looking at policy, we're looking at the congressional, you know, the Congress, Senate. No, no, no we're dealing with the executive branch. We ain't dealing with Congress. Well, we're I'm, dealing I'm, with, I'm saying, with the president. I'm, I'm, saying, I'm saying policy, right? We're looking at legislation. Yes, we're looking with at the bill. president. What did he introduce he with regard to police brutality? He, Give me one bill. He introduced Eric Holder. He introduced... No, no, no. Eric Williams. Holder was the attorney general who well, resigned from office and because he, he did not agree with Obama's lackluster approach to police genocide. Holder quit because Obama was too weak on it. That's why Holder left. He said, you're not going to use me to be the scapegoat for why you're not doing anything about these innocent, defenseless black folks being murdered. Can you, so what's, so I'm, asking what's, you give, what's, I'm asking you to give I'm me a bill. You, and, I'm asking you, and I'm asking you for that, and I, this is not needed. No, 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 no. We're we not think, arguing, brother. We, we, we are conversating. Okay. You understand okay. me? Okay. You're my brother. I got a, I got a question but for you. I want you to give me one bill. I don't care if they got... But I, I, I told you, I told you, I'm not looking at overarching policy. Okay, so you're admitting... A bill is an overarching policy. Anything no, federal is not overarching. overarching. Okay. This, overarching listen, through okay, the system. Right, yes okay, or, right. wait, wait, I got yes or no, yes or no, did Barack Obama introduce any legislation to hold police accountable for the innocent murder of black folks? Yes or no? No, he did not. Thank you. And but it, he did introduce a law to protect was, police. And I'm, I'm trying to bring it down so we can, <laughs> so, so, so we can I want to continue this. I really, I really, 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 really do. Okay. So let me so just jump it, in real quick. I got a sure, question. Sure, sure, sure. What do you think is the single most negative thing that's influencing our community? Like this, the single most thing that's stopping us from being great? I would say the biggest thing, I'm going to give you two that keep black people checkmated in the quicksand of progress is number one, unsubstantiated hope mm. or belief in a promise changed that never come. What was Obama's campaign slogan? Hope we can believe in. Change we can believe in. So Obama held you checkmated, handcuffed psychologically for eight years, delivered you nothing. You know why we don't move anywhere? Because every president, every governor, Every mayor, every state rep, every U.S. rep who comes into office, black or white, tells us, if you be patient, I'm working for you, mm -hmm. black folks. And we believe it. And then their eight years is up. Someone else come in and say the same thing. So we've been waiting and hoping since 1968, the year they killed King. Here we are over 60 years later. 
excuse me, this is the 50th anniversary, mind you. This is the 50th anniversary. This last month was the 50th anniversary of King's assassination. And because of that empty hope, we don't get anywhere because we keep on waiting for an external force to deliver change. That's number one. The other part is the self-hatred. The only thing that hate black people more than white people are people. other black people. Man. And until you change that, that intense psychopathological hatred of each other, you will change nothing else. Can you explain by knowing the root of a problem is as important as knowing the solution? The reason you must know the root is because if your conceptualization of the problem is incorrect, all your solutions are worthless. Mm. Do you understand? And the problem with black folks is we walk into the room and we'll know the problem, but we don't know the root and how it operates. So let's take miseducation, right? Okay. You know the schools don't work. He know the schools don't work. He know the schools don't work. She know the schools don't work. I know the schools don't work. We know the problem. But do you know how it operates? In other words, why don't the schools work? What are the specific variables going on in Cleveland public schools that keeps black children underachieving. You got to be able to say it's the racism, it's the special ed, it's the ADHD, it's the fact that public school was never designed to make black children work, the lack of black male teachers. You see, so only if you understand how a problem operates can you solve it. Black people name problems and they say let's solve it now. Mm. You may have cancer, right? Mm -hmm. I may have cancer, God forbid, mm -hmm. but unless you know what type of cancer, unless you know what triggered that cancer, you can throw every Messing every heat you want at the cat, it will know it because understanding the problem. All right, so uh, before we go, on, let's take a little break. This is uh, this is real good. <laughs> Brand, I see Brandon over there. You got uh, Brandon Sharp. I like Brandon. He's sharp. <laughs> hey, that's why he's here. That's why he's here. So, he's sharp. uh, keep it keep it locked in here on WOVU 95.9. You're on our voice today. We got Dr. Umar Johnson in the studio, Big Squeeze, and Brandon Patterson from BBC. We'll be right back. Word up. Yeah. But see, the thing is, I don't want another black president because we're going to go to sleep again. With oppressed people, I don't give a black, white, or purple. You never give oppressed people the belief that something other than themselves is going to change their reality. You no know one looking outside of something outside can save you. Last year we spent nine billion on perm. Black women could revolutionize Black America by sacrificing their perm dollars. We spent four billion on liquor. Black men could revolutionize Black America with the liquor budget. We spent two billion on Ed Jordan. In other words, all we have to do is pick one item that we're hyper addicted to, sacrifice that money, and you could transform Black America. We want freedom, but we don't want to pay for it. And freedom is the most expensive thing you can get. Because not only will you have to pay for it, you may have to pay with your life. And we're not ready. Mm. The last poet said it best when he said, niggas are scared of revolution. Mm. Hey, you made an incredible point about like how the, the church is the, the center of the black community. And, ah, and, the, and, the, and the, We got to talk about the churches. The bank. Are we gonna wait? I'll wait till we get back on the air for that yes. one, man. I, I got you on that. In fact, the church is, in many respects, a de facto bank. The church is a bank because the money that should be going into banks is going no, into churches. No, wait till churches. we get back on the air. Don't, don't answer that one. Yet. It's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see what I'm saying? Uh, definitely. So instead of investing in our future, we're investing in our death because the purpose of church is to prepare you for heaven. So anytime you give money to the pastor, you are investing in your death. Why in the hell are we spending billions of dollars for death preparation? Mm. We should be spending billions of dollars for life preparation. That's crazy. What's something Dr. Umar had to stop doing in order to keep the movement moving? True. Like, like you necessarily didn't, you didn't necessarily want to stop doing it, but you just decided, yo, I can't do this any longer. If I, gonna, See, you know, I, I never really. Seriously. I'm an old-fashioned type of a brother, okay. so I never party. Okay. I never really smoked. Okay. I never drank. Okay. I was never a club. You know, so I had one blunt my whole life in Jamaica with my roster brothers. 
I, I drink some red wine from time to time, but I don't really have any any quirks. You know, I'm just an old fashioned dude. I'm the type of brother to stay in the house for a month straight. As long as I got something to eat, just chilling. You know what I mean? Read my books. Like it don't take much to keep my attention. So I never had to give up hanging on a corner, smoking with the brothers. It just was never part of who I was. Word up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm with that. That's how I am. Right, that's really yeah, how I am. I've never tasted a drink in my life. Uh, I, I, I chill out. I, I'm here at the radio station all the time. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. That's what I do. They keep you alive, too, because think about how many brothers we lost because they was involved in something. So, who's so, going back? No, no. What type, of, what type of music? What type of music Dr. Umar I'm Meek Mill. To? We from the same block in North Philly. I was gonna ask you something about Meek Mill. 18th Street. So I didn't know him personally. He right. was good friends with my younger brother, but I remember him being in the house playing video games and all that. Oh, where? Yeah, that's dope. But Meek Mill right now is who I listen to the most. But largely, I'm an old school guy. Naughty by Nature first album, the Tupac albums, you know, EMD, Big Daddy Kane, Cool G Rap. So you 80s, KRS, 90s. yeah. Late 80s, early 90s. I listen 90s. to the old stuff, man. This, this mumble rap, I can't do it. Oh, man, that's terrible. Skinny jeans, terrible. hanging out, I can't do it, man. Bro, I, I can't even understand what they saying. Like, I don't even, I, I hate mumble rap. That's terrible to me. You, you got radio all day today? After you guys, I got 93 FM at 12.30. Oh, yeah, WZAK. yeah. WZAK? Yeah. Yeah, salute to them. <laughs> Yeah, we we're the the new station on the block. Okay. Yeah, like we we just been here since. Oh, that's Chris and Nikki playing, eh? Mm-hmm. Got it. We'll stay on. Uh, yeah. Okay. Got a feeling. I know. I know you guys are here. What's up? Let me see. Y'all got some questions while I'm on break? While we on commercial? Yeah. Let's see. Minute, we got one minute before we go back. Let's see what they saying. Hit Ladies. the school system. We gotta hit the school system. We're gonna hit the school system. We're gonna hit the churches. And, um, I got a few other topics. You can hit Kanye. Oh, I, I got a, I got that. The slavery of choice. I got that right here. I got a, I got, I got a list for you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Squeeze, you can bring it back in, alright? All right. We back, WOVU 95.9 FM, Our Voices Today. We here right now with the Honorable Dr. Umar Johnson. Um, Back to our discussion, we were talking some mm-hmm. good stuff before we went to commercial break. I got you. And uh, I just want to pick up where we left off, basically. Yes, sir. Okay, so I want to ask you a question about the churches. You know, you made a good point a while back. I heard you speaking. You said that the church is the center of the black community. While the bank is the center of the white community. Exactly. What do you think, how, how does that affect us? Well, number one, coming out of a legacy of slavery, we were never taught the importance of economic stability. We had always been reared with these false negative conceptions such as money is the root of all evil and a camel will go through the eye of a needle before a rich man goes to heaven. Mm. So for many black people, we have demonized and pathologized money. And if you demonize and pathologize money, then not having any money, to some extent, is viewed as a virtue and a blessing. You know, the meek shall inherit the earth. The poor shall get into heaven. So when you look at the way that money is taught in the black community, it teaches you that money is evil, that if you are rich, you necessarily did something wrong to get there. And if you're broke, Mm. you're somehow blessed by God to not have nothing. And we have to change those types of beliefs because they feed the disastrous types of spending habits that black people engage in. If you think being broke is a blessing, why would I save? Why would I plan for the next generation? Mm. If my whole life is about getting into heaven, what difference does it make if I save any money or not? So we have been oriented towards finance in a very dysfunctional way. That benefits the church. Because if I keep on making people think that not having any money is a blessing, and that's the behavior that God wants you to adopt, then guess what? They'll just bring all the money to me. And the problem with the black church is not what they teach. I don't have a problem with the Bible. I don't have a problem with the Quran. Because when I speak of church, I'm speaking of all black religious institutions. My problem is with what they don't do with the money that they get. Listen, 
We give the black church no less than $14 million every Sunday, nationally. Mm. $14 million every Sunday, nationally. With that type of money, why doesn't the church have a hospital? Is there a black church with a hospital? Is there a black church with a clinic that they finance, not with a grant from the uh, Food and Drug Administration? Mm. Where's the black church with the bank? Where's the black church with the supermarket? Where's the black church with the factory? Where's the black church with the distribution network? They keep talking about why black men don't go to church. They're trying to find out why we can't get more brothers in church. I'll tell you why. Because there's no jobs in church. The number one responsibility of a black man is to provide for his family. And if you can't help me provide, why would I be bothered with you? If you want more black men in the church, then make church functional. And in order to make church functional, the first function is to help black men get jobs so they can stay the hell out of jail. Mm. That's dope. Um, a lot of today's youth, we appear to like, we, we got like champagne dreams on like a 40 ounce budget. Got any advice for that? Well, number one, black youth have been socialized to be extremely materialistic. This is the fault of their parents. This is the fault of the larger black community. Even when you look at the black church, the average black pastor is extremely materialistic. Extremely. Oh, yeah. They drive Benzes. They drive Bentleys. They live in multi-million dollar homes. They wear Armani suits, alligator shoes. So how are you preaching to the meek when you yourself are not meek? So we have to recognize a black youth growing up in America today, they're taught to worship materialism. When I, I work in schools, I'm a school psychologist. So when I walk into a kindergarten classroom and I see a kid with the Rolex watch on at six, oh, wow. 250 pair of Jordans, $250 pair of Jordans at six, $200 pair of true religion jeans at six, he's being socialized to materialism. Yeah. And one of the biggest mistakes we're making in our community is we're uh, socializing our children to materialism and to athletics. That's the other problem I have. Black boys are continuously being socialized to be physically active. That's exactly what slavery was. Estimating one's worth based on their physical output. Mm. That was slavery. But we got all these black fathers telling their sons that, you know, the way to make it, the way to get rich is to be able to catch that ball, be able to run down that track, be able to shoot that basketball. You're socializing him to physical activity. That is slavery, measuring your son's worth based on his physical output. And then, the black bourgeois brothers who ran away from the community to move to the suburbs and often white wife at that, they have also been interested to the black community. Because this will quick blame the gangster rappers for such mm. The doctor used to live in the ghetto. When W.E.B. Du Bois taught at the University of Pennsylvania, guess where he lived at? Now, this is America's top black scholar. He lived in the ghetto with the rest of us. Wow. The, 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 the Ph.D. lived right next door to a single black mother on public assistance because racism didn't allow you to live with the white professors. So back then, there was no separation of status. That's, that's a great... See, that's now a, we have a separation of status. So once a Negro get a master's, he's out. So the dentist ain't on the block no more. The principal not on the block no more. The engineer not on the block no more. The psychologist not on the block no more. So the kids are automatically looking to the rappers because the black professionals have abandoned the youth. That's a great segue to my next question. Um, my, my, I believe that segregation had more pros than cons. I think it brought out the best of us. What's your view? Segregation on that? had more pros than cons. Yes, I agree with you. We did better when we were separate. But why were we? Why did we do better though? Because the white man didn't allow you to participate in his reality. The reason you had a black Wall Street in the first place is because the white man did not allow you to participate in his reality. The only reason why they desegregated black America was to get the black dollar. Yeah. In fact, when you look at the Civil Rights Bill, the Civil Rights Bill doesn't fall under human rights law. The Civil Rights Bill fa falls under antitrust and commerce law. It was an economic bill. It wasn't about respecting black people. It was about disintegrating the black power base. It was about making sure white capital could exploit black money, and we fell for it. Let's be clear. America never integrated black America. America only desegregated black America. Mm. In other words, they simply said, if you want to live in this neighborhood, you can. If you want to come to this college, you can. If you want to work in this factory, you can. But they never forced you to do it. Here's where we blame the government for something that we're responsible for. The government never said, give up your private black uh, 
public schools. The government never said give up your private black hospitals. The government never said give up your private black oh. uh, supermarkets. So because they allowed us to be they a allowed town, us. They de we decided we didn't need our own anymore. We couldn't wait for white folks to give us a chance to be with them. Wow. You understand? Yeah. We couldn't wait for white folks to give us a chance to be with them. What's one of the biggest topics trending now? Should black men date white women? Now, I dealt with this on Roland Martin. No, 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 because you're you, you jumping into my question. But, 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 but stay with question. it, though. All right. The black man's fetish for the white woman is probably the best example that we can show you how much we are in love with our oppressors. Okay, let me just speak on it then, because that was my next question. That's, like, basically the only thing I disagree with you on, too. You said if a black man marries a white woman. That's right. He's just basically doing that because he wants to be white himself. Of course. Can you speak on that? The white woman is the black man's validation tool. The white woman is what makes the black man feel like he's equal to the white man. The white woman is what makes the black man uh, get rid of his inferiority complex. Now, I've never been committed to a white woman before. However, I would be lying if I said I'm not attracted to him. Well, first of all, you're a man. Human nature, you might see an attractive white woman. I've seen an attractive white woman. Said, damn, she built like a sister. She look all right. I'm not going to date her, and I'm not going to sleep with her. Because your political priorities determine your personal behavior. Okay, now explain to me why I'm wrong, because I'm sleeping with her. I'll tell you why. Because okay. she belongs to the race that has oppressed your race for well over 400 years. Why do I want to sleep, marry, cohabitate or bring children in this world with a member of the race that is responsible for my people's place in this planet. So if I'm pro-black, am I anti-white? No. Being pro-black has nothing to do with being anti-white. But the reason people think that when you're pro-black, you're anti-white is because white nationalism includes racism and bigotry. When a white person says, I'm a white nationalist, an aspect of white ideology dictates that if you fall white, you hate black. White nationalism is a racist ideology. Pan-African nationalism isn't racist at all. We say the white man can do whatever he want to do, but we're going to do what's best for us. Mm. We say African family first. It is the ultimate contradiction for a black man to say, I am for my people, childish Gambino included. Mm. Childish Gambino, I don't give a damn how many videos you make about racism in America. Uh -huh. When you're done making that video, you take your ass home to a white woman and that's who you sleep with. So you're not loyal to us. You're not committed to us. You are faking the funk. I a real black man will be with a black woman. I seen that's him period, say, point blank. I seen him say that he couldn't be with a white woman. What you mean he couldn't be with a black woman? I seen him, in, I seen him in the interview say that he's not with a white woman. That He, he got children with the white woman. I understand. I'm just telling you what he just, this was just like a week ago. He said he has to be with someone who's racist like him, who he can talk to, who understands the problems he so feels. So why this he got a, babies with the white this girl? This is a quote from Childish Gambino. But he got I, the baby with the white girl. It's all over the internet. I can't explain that. You only got the babies with the white girl? I seen him so with a white girl. This, this is a good segue because we were talking in the break. <laughs> I wanted to talk about Kanye a little bit. Yeah, that was my next one. Right, yeah, okay. All right, Kanye West recently said a bunch of interesting things, all right? I personally disagree with some of them, but one thing I did agree with was the, the free thinking aspect of it. What do you what think about that? Like, what was, what was he that? said that America needs to uh, be more independent in, in their thinking. They need to have more free thinkers. Okay, we need more free thinkers. So then my question for Kanye West, if you're such a free thinker, why is your hair dying? If you're such a free thinker, <laughs> are you an African woman? If you're such a free thinker, but in hell have you Chicago your hometown as a millionaire? See, my issue is Kanye West needs to manifest what he's talking about. But see, I've always had an issue with black entertainers being our spokespersons. Are you aware we're the only people whose entertainers are their spokespersons? Mm. That I'm you never see I Seinfeld. Agree. You right. Seinfeld was the, one of the most, most popular American shows ever. Yeah. He was probably the top Jewish comedian. He was never the spokesperson for European Jews. Thanks. We're the only people whose athletes and entertainers are our spokespersons, which is ironic. Why? Because the black athlete and the black entertainer is normally the most coonish member of the community. Their whole life is dictated by white folks. Okay. When we looked at the Colin Kaepernick protest, mm -hmm. okay, which I think was probably one of the most cowardly uh, uh, incidents in the black community, in which I saw 
Ray Lewis. Deion Sanders, who was my favorite football player, act like Coon. Chicken Little Bark, act like Coon. When I asked him what contract he did, he said, brother, did a job. Right. Because we say black folks. You know what they said? Oh, he made a mistake. He should apologize. Michael Vick said he should cut his hair so he can be more appealing. These are the biggest, strongest black men in the community, and they're also the most cowardly. Wow. So wait, so going back to the Kanye and Childish. Mm -hmm. So you take a black man who is with a white woman. Can black men who are married to or have babies with white women do good for the black community? Can a black man who is married to or have babies with a white woman do good? They can do some good, but they can never be part of the ultimate good because they're part of the ultimate problem. Love of one's oppressor. Mm. So Kanye and Childish Cambino, they might come build an institution for the community. They might do some charitable event for the community. But at the end of the day, they're not ready to say that all white people are racist because they're sleeping with them. And in order for black people to come out of our quagmire, we must all be able to admit unapologetically that all white people are racist. Because as long as you make an exception, you allow infiltration into the movement. They so, can be of some good. They can never be of ultimate good. So if so if they can do some good, when we're looking at like the levels of goodness, okay, then where do we as black people say, okay, Childish Gambino, you can offer something good to us? Do we reject no. what he's offering? If Childish Gambino wants to do something in the hood, you let him do it. You never stop any black person from doing something that's useful. But when we go into a meeting room like this and we're about to strategize how we're about to take over the politics of Cleveland. We're about to strategize how we're going to corner the hotel market in Cleveland. We're about to strategize how we're going to take over the produce industry in Cleveland. When we strategize about how we're going to take over the shellfish market in the state of Ohio, Childish Cambino can't be there. Why? Kanye can't be there. Why? Because Pillow Talk is a mother. Pillow and when they go home real. at night, they sleep on a bed with a member of the enemy scamp. And in that free speech, <laughs> and while they digging up in her white stale cookies, they're going to release some of the secrets that we discussed in this meeting. And that's why they can never be part of the ultimate good. Choose who you want to stand with. We got to stop letting black people think you can talk black and live white. The mm. struggle is not part time. This is a full time struggle. But me. what we want to do is spend eight hours with black folks with the fist up and then you want to spend the other 18 hours with white folks sleeping with them not at all you are with us or you are against us there is no middle ground so what you're saying is that there is no what i'm hearing from that is that if we're looking at the table we're looking at the strategy that there is no value in a childish gambino or in a kanye west no there's some value but here's the question the value is the let me tell you the biggest problem we got in the black community right now, unmarried single black mothers. That's one of our biggest problems. The black woman is less likely to get married than any other woman in America. So if you want to fix the family, fix the nation, fix the community, you got to do something about that situation. Word up. So Childish Gambino walks into a room with a hundred black boys. A hundred black boys with a white wife. How in the hell does he tell them that they have an obligation to black women when he doesn't even demonstrate an obligation to black women? You see, it's deeper than his superficial charity. It goes to what you represent and what type of example you're making for other black boys. Are you married? Not married. I will be. I have two beautiful daughters. 16 and 7. So if if the family is the greatest unit, right? It's the greatest unit. And if, and if we our role models yes. and leading by example and if we have to sacrifice mm -hmm. right wouldn't that be how, and I, I guess i don't want to ask no, go, ahead, age, go, ahead, go ahead my brother I, throw it out but I, That's I, what I, we I, have I, I assume you're you know m middle ish age yes sir you know um why hasn't that been a sacrifice that you have made the reason i'm not married yet is because number one the lord didn't show me the queen for me before this responsibility came on the international level. I always say every day that if I could ask God two things, my ancestors, two things. Number one, why didn't you give me a wife before you gave me this responsibility? And why didn't you give me a team of people I could trust? If I had a wife and a team of people I could trust, I know for a fact I'd be eons further than where I am now. I know a wife is necessary in order for me to com complete my mission. Mm. She's essential, but I must choose her carefully now. Because being an international personality, the women who I meet are more interested in what I am than who I am. They don't want the struggle. 
They want the Facebook pictures. They want the limelight. They want to sit at the dinners. They want to travel around. But they don't want the sweat and the tears. They don't want the arrest. They don't want worrying about the FBI manipulating your success. They don't want none of that. They want the bourgeois aspect of being Dr. Umar. They don't want the struggle of being Brother Ifa Tunde. And because I'm only getting married one time, won't be no divorces for me. I'm getting married one time. And so I'm going to take my time in choosing my queen. I will not rush it. I will not rush it. But isn't that the same argument that a Kanye West would state? No, because Kanye is married to a non-African cracker. But, 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 <laughs> okay? But, 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 hear, hear, he hear, has hear committed himself to a woman who ain't black. And hear me out. Oh, and man. obviously, I do not know Kanye. I'm not in, in his You brain. know Kim Kardashian, don't you? <laughs> do you know who Kim Kardashian but is? what I'm saying is that. All right, then. Thinking, thinking of, of a Kanye West. I would assume that he would make a similar argument of the fact that the people who he, you know, attracts. I think a lot of black men say that, oh, I got this money, I got brother, this, these black women around me. Go, I think that we, we brother, all I'm a PhD. People. I work with white women every day. I went to school with them. White women are very attracted to me. Yes, they are. I even get emails from white women saying, I wish you would consider because I would love to be your queen. You understand? <laughs> but because I'm loyal to black women, there's no way I'm getting in a bed with her and there's no way she getting in a bed with me. Mm. I get what you're saying. Political principles right, dictate right. personal All right, let's switch the topic. Let's switch the topic. I'm 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 I got a question. Uh, but I need you to be clear that your, pol your politics dictate your behavior unless you're a hypocrite. Word. Your politics, if you saw me with a white girl 10 years from now, I'm telling you right now, you call me a coon on the spot. Because there's no way you could have been talking what you talked in Cleveland 10 years ago right. and end up with a white girl now. Listen to this. The situation does not make you. It only reveals who you were to yourself all along. If you ever see me with a cracker, you know I was jobbing you this whole time. So let's, before we go on any more questions, let's take a break. We'll be right back. Here on our voices today is this is one of the uh, this is dope this is dope <laughs> brothers and sisters dr umar johnson will be at the african-american museum in cleveland tonight come on out the doors open up at five all children free and we're going to deal with the economics and education of extermination so with that being said we're going to take our final break and we'll be right back with our voices today all right Man, what, what questions y'all got for him through the break? I got my Facebook. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> man, you got my page. I got going. my page. <laughs> oh, man. This is Dr. Umar, this is Jeremy Boone. Peace and love, man. brother Jeremy. How we doing there? I'm good, man. I'm a big fan good of Good day to you. He, um, he, hosts, uh, he hosts our sports show here at WVU, <laughs> okay. uh, Fourth of Inches, um, and uh, he had a uh, question or two to ask. Oh, sure, 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 sure. I'm, I'm really going to just, I'm going to ask one sports question. And no doubt, no doubt. Question about, like, you know, my family, my daughter. Okay, okay. I didn't know you had two daughters. So two daughters, rich, brother. Man. No sons. Well, yeah, man. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Awesome. 20 miles, man. No I'm doubt, no doubt. I'm here with Dr. Umar, man. Word up. So, yeah, man. Let me see what they ask. Well, they say, why is it so hard? Why is it so hard for high-level brothers from various fields to get together and build? Because the educated brothers are more interested in being integrated into the white man's power structure. They're not trying to build anything separate. Mm -hmm. Negroes are lazy. We want things easy. Why we ain't got no black hospital with all the poor health care we get? Because these black doctors don't want to build no independent nothing. Why well, we ain't got no independent black schools? We got a couple, but not as many as we need with all these black educators out here. Because all we want to do is cherry pick the white man's reality and then complain about it when it, do when it doesn't suit our purposes. Mm. Pan-Africanism can be summed up in one phrase. I don't care what the white man got. I don't care what the white man got. I don't care what the white man got. Our own. You, you being from Philly, give me your thoughts on uh, Meek Mills and Bill Cosby. Uh, well, Bill Cosby was set up, but that's also an example for black men to stay away from white women. Those white women set that man up, and a power structure used them. If Bill Cosby wasn't addicted to white coochie, his ass wouldn't have got lynched. <laughs> but at the same time, I feel sorry for him, because being 80 years old and about to go to jail, yeah, I know that's weighing on that brother, and I just hope 
he's strong enough to withstand all that because I'm afraid that the the, the, the psychological trauma yeah, of gonna it take him out. may take him out, yeah, man. Yeah. And you hear what white woman said? We don't care about it. The white woman you sleeping with is still a racist. She's still a racist. Mm. And as far as the Meek Mill situation, I'm glad he's out. Him and Jay about to do a documentary on the prison system. I just want Meek to stay sharp because it looks like they're using the power structure. Robert Kraft, owner of the Patriots, and all these white celebrities yeah. gathering around Meek Mill. Well, wait a minute. Mass incarceration been a problem for a long time. Why y'all want to gather around Meek Mill? Y'all could have been gathered around something. So I just want Meek Mill not to be co-opted by the white power structure. Because to me, it looks like they're trying to keep him from the brothers on the street so he can't be a part of a true criminal justice revolution. All right, so do you think Bill Cosby isn't guilty? I believe Bill Cosby may be guilty of some of the things that they claim. He's not guilty of all of those things. Most of it is lies. In fact, one of them is lied under guilty. oath. Another one was even caught. A woman testified that she said, she told her that if you falsely accuse, accuse a celebrity, you can get rich quick. Here's the question you got to ask yourself. Why does it benefit a white woman to wait 15, 40, in some cases 50 years? Black male celebrity. Right. You benefit from white privilege. He right, suffers yeah, from right. white racism. Yeah, right you could have destroyed Bill Cosby in his crime yeah. and his prime, and you waited forty years more. to tell him. Give me a break. Give two. me a break. Right. They crushed Bill Cosby because he wanted to buy NBC. That's what that was about. Right. There you go, white coochie. Can't leave it alone. Bill Cosby, Kanye, and Childish Gambino, white coochie lovers. <laughs> All right, and we're back with our voices today here on WOVU 95.9 FM, and we uh, we have a couple more things to go before the hour is up. Mm -hmm. uh, we brought in Jeremy Boone from Fourth and Inches. You can hear that show uh, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 2 o'clock, 2.30, excuse me, and it's live. All right, so Jeremy uh, had a couple questions for uh, the good doctor here in the studio right now. Jeremy, go ahead and, and do your thing. Well, first I want to say thank you for you know having me on, Gio. Man, I appreciate being here with you. I'm honored to be here with Dr. Umar John. Oh, the honor is mine, bro. Man, uh, you you kind of touched on it earlier about the uh, Kaepernick situation. Um, yes. Right now, he uh, you know he had a collusion case against the NFL. Yes. So I don't know if you saw that it was documents that was yeah. leaked about you that know, they did come together, come together and collude to keep him out of the league. Right. So with that. What do you think can happen to that? I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that his lawyer is crafty enough to use this case to bring Kaepernick so much money that the brother can still live the quality of life that he would have lived had he still been in the NFL. So I'm just hoping he can be compensated financially for the loss. So at this point, you think his, he's done trying to play football? Not yet, but it looks like they're pretty adamant about not letting him in. And it's not about Kaepernick. It's about everybody after Kaepernick. Right. right. The white man uses individual black people to send a message to the rest. Bill Cosby's case wasn't really about Bill Cosby. It was about any rich black man who think he's going to buy any major institution in America. Mm. Ka Kaepernick's case was about any black athlete thinking you're stronger than the system of the NFL and NBA yourself. Yeah. It exposes the myth of the strong black athlete. There is no strong black athlete. All of them are in bed with the white power structure. Mm. Whoever makes it can take it. Okay. Um, next question I have for you is my, about my daughter. Uh, you told me you had two daughters yourself. Yes. And basically, in the you know inner city community, we had a problem with you know single moms, like you said. Yes. Single moms having multiple you know child fathers. Yes. And me raising a daughter, and you know, and seeing you know she growing up seeing these you know things with mm -hmm. women you know having multiple mm -hmm. fathers. So it's just like. It's common, like you know, it's embedded in them, so mm -hmm. they see it. So it's, you know, something that they all automatically know, think is right. right. How can I, you know, teach my daughter like, you know, these things, you know, are right? I'm raising a queen, a princess. The two most important things that a father can do is number one, give their daughter the example of how a black man is supposed to treat them. So when she becomes an adult, she has a standard that she'll never depart from. And number two, to make sure your daughter has supreme self-confidence. 
by constantly reassuring her, constantly telling her how much you love her, constantly spending time with her, constantly letting her know that you might have made a mistake this time, but you can correct it tomorrow. If we give our daughter supreme self-confidence and the example of what a black man is supposed to be, those two things in and of itself will serve as a protector against her ever falling game to the hustle of any brother who don't have good intentions for her. We have to be the example. It's not what we tell them, it's what we show them. We have to show our daughters that they are queens. We can't just tell them that they are queens. But the reason why we have so many girls having babies as teenagers is because their father wasn't there to do that for them. Teenage pregnancy is not about sex. Teenage pregnancy is about fatherlessness. Teenage pregnancy is about girls who still craves the father's validation. Every girl needs their father to put them on a pedestal. And when the father's not there to put the girl on the pedestal, mm. she will find any Negro to do what daddy never did. Mm. It's deep, man. Yeah, that's right. so big squeeze. You got All the last, right. last word before we go out. All right, it's got a few quick questions, man. I want to touch on these. Um, a few months ago, you were faced with some fines for, uh, you know, the lack of a psychology license. Can you speak on that? Yes, sir. Uh, January the 8th, I had to stand trial, state of Pennsylvania, uh, before the State Board of Psychology. I was accused of practicing psychology without a license. The accusation didn't come directly from the state, even though the case came from the state. It was Coons, Negroes in the black community, jealous persons who don't have my credentials and who are jealous of my standing within the black consciousness movement who continue to send letters of petition and condemnation to the state board. Mm. So we had a hearing, which should have never took place. And the reason the hearing was totally bogus is because in the state of Pennsylvania, if you are a certified school psychologist, which I am, you can practice privately without a license. That's the law. Right. If you are a certified school psychologist and if you saw the case, I, I spoke that. I don't think they knew I knew my rights though. Right. I can practice privately because I'm certified. I never so you see the play? Well, let me tell you what happened. So about two weeks ago, I received the order from the hearing officer. Her order was to dismiss the case because it was frivolous. It was unfounded. But she, she don't have the final say. Guess who has the final say? The state board of Who were not present at the hearing. So even though the hearing officer said, John, not guilty, but they still have killed. So I'm waiting for the final decision from the state board of psychology. So what, what does that mean for you? It means I would never be able to earn my license, mm. which doesn't really bother me because most of my work is in the schools. It's private choose. anyway. So you say, well, Doc, if you had your license, what could you do that you're not doing now? I could work privately with adults, and I could build the insurance for the fee. So, I could work privately with adults anyway as a life coach. I know. You know we, I mean? we, so it really don't hurt what I'm trying to do. We're running a long time, so I'm, I'm, I got one last question. Sure. I see the situation with uh, Mr. Boyce Watkins. And with uh, Mr. Tariq and the yeah. shade and the situation. Um, do you want to speak on that? I don't want to get you too hyped. No, 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 no. no. I yeah. ain't got no problem with them. I just don't want my name coming out their mouth. You know, I don't speak on nobody. You've never heard me disrespect or speak on anybody. Even if I think you're a fraud, mm -hmm. I don't speak on you. Those situations came about because they spoke on me in a negative way. I mind my business. Anytime you ever see me happy, it's because somebody is speaking on me in a negative way. Listen, do your hustle. I'm not bothering y'all brothers. Do, do you, your hustle. Do you regret doing Hidden Colors? I don't regret it. Why? Because positive information for the people is positive information for the people. Do you think the people see you as a fraud now? How they going to see me as a fraud? I say more black children than any person in America. I'm just saying because, you know, the accusations against you, you got, you know, Tariq saying the things he's saying, and you got, you Well, know, he ain't got no credentials. Facts, and but, but you got the situation with, with, with the, uh, you know, the fees you just had to pay for the... But I won the case. I'm just saying, do you think in the eyes of the public, people look at you as a fraud? It depends. If they're looking at the facts, how can you see me as a fraud? You, you follow me? Yeah, I see what you're saying. For sure. I'm the number one black school psychologist in American history. If I die the day or tomorrow, no name will go higher than mine than that. Word I've up. saved more black kids from prison, from special ed, from ADHD medicine. I've rescued more black parents. You understand? So if you look at my work, forget the YouTube, forget the Facebook, forget the Instagram. The problem is we live in a social network generation. Yeah, I and what they don't see don't count. But most of my work is not on social network because as a psychologist, your work is private. I can't run around and tell you I stopped them from committing suicide. I can't run around and tell you I saved them from getting a divorce. I can't run around and tell you that I stopped them from taking another brother's life. I can't tell you that I'm the reason that kid over there went back to school. But if I go through my email right now, I can show you no less than 1,000. No less than 1,000 emails from men, women, children across the world, not just America, who say, you the reason I made it. You the reason I'm not in jail. I just met a sister on the street the other day. She stopped me. You know what she said? 
I got my own daycare center, and guess why I got it? I watched one of your videos, and you motivated me to do that. I got emails with married husband and wife saying, you the reason we didn't get a divorce. Well, I got little black boys texting me, Dr. Umar, I'm about to get my engineering degree in college. Six years ago, I was on the street, and you came and spoke at my juvenile detention center, and you changed my life. Right. So anybody who look at the sum total of my work, if I'm a fraud, what must everybody else be in the conscious community? Because I'm damn sure more relevant than all them put together. Work Every up. last one, I'm an elder or you. You can't name one person who's putting more work in the black community than me in the conscious community. Not one. Salute to you, sir, man. I'm doing my questions, and I want you to know that this is an honor. Oh, I enjoyed I'm, it. I'm, uh, I'm very grateful for this. Thank it, you. Welcome here. Brandon, yes, sir. Take care. Anytime, you're welcome. Tonight, Cleveland is going down. African American Museum. Doors at 5, lecture at 7. I'm ready to go. I will have my book, Psychoacademic Holocaust. If you don't have one, you need to come get one. How can people I, give you a follow? Oh, they can follow me on Instagram, at Dr. Umar Johnson. Twitter, at Dr. Umar Johnson. And on Facebook and YouTube, I use my African last name, which is Ifatunde. So on Facebook, I'm Dr. Umar Ifatunde. And on YouTube, I'm Prince Ifatunde. Facebook, Dr. Umar Ifatunde. And YouTube, Prince Ifatunde. Word up. All right, so. One love. Thank you, Dr. Umar. That was a good one there. Right on. <laughs> so, uh, that you, that you was a good to, one there. <laughs> you listen to our voice today, Big Squeeze. Brandon, I thank you for coming in. Jeremy, we're going to hear you at 2.30, right? We're going to be live. There we go. So uh, we want to thank you. We want you to come back next week when we have uh, Mr. Brooks and Mr. King back. You listen to our voice today. Thank you, and have a wonderful weekend. Salute. We're out. Thank you. Man, it was a pleasure, man. I, that was oh, dope. man, the honor's mine. Y'all should come Salute to the Salute to y'all for watching, man. Definitely, definitely, Support the definitely. movement. I can get y'all in there because it's moving. The you feel me? Fast, what so up? Just text me. Be like, Radio.com. You know I mean? We're going to be there at 8 o'clock. And these the names, and I'll put them on the front door. You feel me?